Hey guys, today I decided to make an updated version of my Discoid Roach breeding guide since I had to start my project over due to life constraints I had in early 2024. This time around, I'm going to go a little bit more into the nuance and cover a useful tool that you can make from home. This video should cover just about everything you need to know to potentially grow your project into something much larger, along with a harebrained idea I have to help do it, sorta. But first, before we get started, I wanted to mention I have an eBay store up with a few items in it. More items will come eventually, Right now, it's just a few. I also have a Facebook group that is slowly growing, Casey's Mealworm, Superworm, and Discoid Roach Knowledge Center. Join in on the discussion today. And with that out of the way, let's start the video. First, let's talk about enclosure, humidity, and heat. In my previous videos, I was using something along an 18 gallon storage container. I cut holes in the lid and put a dual layer of screen in for restricted ventilation. I have since upgraded to using 27 gallon storage containers. You will need something to increase the surface area inside your enclosure, so egg crates are ideal but cardboard can work to provide a place for your roaches to feel safe and for them to congregate and live their lives. If you are using egg crates you can quite literally stuff the bin full and it'd be perfectly fine. The more you have in there within reason the more members your colony can hold. Some people like me leave a little space for a food dish for their dry food but others do very much pack the thing full of egg crates and use an egg crate to set on top and act as a feeding platform. It's pretty brilliant to be honest. If I can find some footage I'll have had it playing. I personally no longer use use a lid for my enclosure, at least for right now, due to my humidity being above 40% indoors on a normal day, which states the requirements of discoid roaches, as 40-60% to 60 is suggested. If this is the case for you, half the work is already done, or you can use a toned down version for yourself to help manage it. As long as humidity stays between the suggested ranges, you will have very little upkeep to do in regards to humidity. Something I find to be a bit of a requirement is a humidity and temperature gauge. You will most likely need a heating pad with a thermostat as well. There are a variety of options, I personally use a Bluetooth digital humidity and temperature gauge set in the room. I highly suggest something that can handle humid conditions, so something analog like what I'm showing right here would be ideal to keep inside your enclosure. You can fasten it to the wall of the enclosure with something like an adhesive strip or even velcro. You should be misting your enclosure a few times a week, up to almost every day, depending on where you live. If you live somewhere that has a dry climate that keeps your home humidity down towards 20 and 30 percent, you're going to need to spray often, have restricted ventilation, and possibly some type of substrate to help retain moisture. I do not exactly suggest using a substrate unless it is very fine because it will make harvesting the nymphs a pain in the butt to do and stifle your production and retention of roach frass. More on this later, which is important to the overall health of your nymphs and your colony. Eventually, frass can work as a medium to retain moisture, but it can take a while for that much frass to build up. But honestly, in dry climates, a substrate may be a requirement to meet their requirements of moisture. I think the overall best solution is to buy some kind of humidifier that can handle the size of the room and maintain the humidity level that is ideal for the roaches and forego substrate altogether. Another thing to note about humidity, since we will almost always be using a heating pad, the heat from it will cause the enclosure to dry out faster. I highly, highly suggest against heat bolts. You can scorch your roaches and cause your enclosure to dry out super, super fast. I also find it a little bit dangerous to use in or around cardboard and plastic. I have heard of people doing it in the past, so I figured I would give it a mention here. Since heat will cause our moisture to evaporate quicker, this is a factor that adds to the complexity of their humidity requirements. As mentioned earlier, we will need a thermostat and heating pad. I recommend a combo so that the heating pad is rated for temperature control. In the past, I have tried to use heating pads meant for other uses with varying success, most of the time damaging the heating pad in the process. The cost difference isn't enough to use something substandard. Something that is used for either reptiles or plants. I suggest more towards plants because the size of the heating pad will be larger, which is what we need. Something for germinating seeds is really good and what I have always used myself. I'll have something on screen to give you an idea. Anyhow, I suggest keeping the thermostat around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd suggest to try to aim for 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the bin, but you have to factor in where the probe is at and the extra layer of plastic between the roaches and the heating pad, as well as taking into account that the adults will mostly be off the floor. This will probably yield something like 85 degrees on the floor of the bin and a little less higher up, which isn't perfect, but it's good enough. As long as the temps don't drop into the 60s and 50s, your colony will most likely be fine. They can survive 70 to 75, which is the highest I can maintain in my previous living condition, and they still bred. I do suggest keeping them much warmer, as insect metabolism is linked to heat. The warmer they are, the quicker they process food, grow, breed, and gestate. If you want your colony to produce as much as possible, you want to aim to keep them towards 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
possibly a little higher if you feel comfortable, but certainly under 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They are not super strict on their temperature or humidity requirements, but I do suggest you aim for 40 to 60% humidity, 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit as your goal to maintain. Now let's talk a bit about nymphs and food. Nymphs come out very, very small. For a fair portion of their life, they will eat the frass of the colony from adults. This helps build their gut bacteria and leads to a more healthy colony. This is why it is important to retain your frass and why I think substrate isn't the best option if it can be avoided at all. Frass helps feed the newborns and juvies for a few months. It is important that they have veggies and other dry foods available, but it is important to have frass as well. Veggies can consist of things like collard greens, kale, lettuce, carrots, or potatoes. Potatoes. Some fruits like grapes and oranges are safe as they do not mold super easy and tend to dry out before they get to that point. In regards to feeding, I suggest using some type of dish to put their dry food in. For dry food, you can use a variety of products like oats, wheat bran, ground rabbit pellets, or even ground pig food. I suggest always having something available. They will consume it very quick. Moist food can be placed directly onto the floor of the enclosure, but do keep in mind that mold is possible, so keep an eye on it. Since we want to avoid mold, we want to feed the colony just enough food to last one to one and a half days. Anything more than that is too much and increases the risk of mold, and it just isn't worth it to be lazy and try to feed them for multiple days. You don't need to feed them every day either. You can opt for every other day, which is what I currently do, but I am almost certain once the project gets a lot bigger, it will not be feasible money-wise until I can actually start selling. I know twice a week is more than enough to keep the colony safe and healthy. Right now, I am providing food more often to give them the best chances of attaining as much energy and growing as fast as possible so they can start establishing more colonies. Let's talk a bit about lifespan and life cycle. It takes roughly five months, give or take, for newborn nymphs to become adults. It then takes roughly another one to two months for the adult female to produce a clutch of 20 to 30 nymphs, which starts to cycle over. From birth to death, Eurotius can live upwards of two years. Some may pass away due to uncontrollable factors, but it should be uncommon for adults to perish if their care is ship-shaped. Discoid roaches also give live birth, fun fact. They hold their, and I have been pronouncing this wrong for years, an uuthika inside them. Yeah, it's, it's... Google it, Uuthika, which is a fancy name for their type of egg case, and eventually gives birth to them, basically crawling out of her rear end as she protrudes the egg casing. They can vent the Uuthika to regulate things like temperature and humidity. Females will do this periodically. Something I didn't mention, though remains true for almost anything with an exoskeleton, is that as they grow, they molt. They will crawl out of their hardened skin with fresh, soft, white chitin. As it's exposed to oxygen, it hardens and darkens to their hallmark dark and light brown. There is sexual dimorphism between males and females. Males are a little bit smaller and on the bottom side of their rear abdomen have segmented plates and a lighter underbelly, like this. Females are generally larger or more thick looking than males. Females have a singular large plate at the bottom of their rear abdomen, like this, along with a darker underbelly. Discoid roaches also have a distinct mating ritual. Males will approach females and start raising and lowering its wings rapidly while jittering its abdomen. The male will then turn around as if offering her something. If the female accepts, they will turn rear to rear and exchange genetic material. This is one of the seldom animals where reproduction is completely consensual. Now let's talk about a very useful tool that you can make yourself. I learned this from Supreme Gecko. Link to his video about this in the card above, which I highly suggest you taking a look at his channel as he is very knowledgeable and is one of the YouTubers I started watching when I first started taking care of my roaches. Anyhow, I'll cover it real fast. It's a sorter. You can use basically any container for it. You need a bin drilled at half inch, three eighths of an inch, five sixteenths of an inch, and one quarter of an inch, and one undrilled container at the bottom to catch the smallest nymphs and roach frass. This tool is homemade and free to make, and from what I understand, Supreme Gecko was one of the first people, if not the first person, to share this type of sorter on YouTube. I could be wrong. Someone possibly made it before Supreme Gecko, but his channel is where I first saw it. You need five buckets, a drill bit set, and a power drill. Starting from the biggest drill bit to the smallest, draw holes in the bottom of the bin to allow for roaches to fall through as you shake it around. The largest will catch adults and nymphs that are almost adults. The next will grab excels, the one after will grab large, the one after that will grab medium, and the last one with no holes will grab the small newborn nymphs. It's a very simple item to make. 
and even with buying all the items brand new, it's less than $60 to make. This will eventually pay off when you start having to harvest nymphs. This item does it so quickly, it removes some of the biggest chores and care for discoid roaches, which for me was frast and nymph control. I recently made this sorter and used it for the first time, with my colony being around 4 months old, so I should have had 2 full gestations of nymphs for every female I had. I took everything below large and put it in a new colony bin, where I will allow them to grow on their own and become a producing colony within 7 months time. Remember about 5 months of growth and then 2 months of gestation. This will not only get me prepared for taking care of 2 colonies, I'll have 2 small colonies, which should make moving up to 4, 8, etc easier later on. So Sorting the nymphs out and starting a new colony and taking care of two when I only need to take care of one is my harebrained idea, if you guys happen to remember me mentioning that. It may not be the best idea, but I need to work on my discipline. I needed to see if I could handle two bins at once, and I can. I usually try to cut work out, but for my project, I'm going to be creating a little extra work so I know where my limit is later on before I actually get there. Last, let's go over the items needed to start this project before wrapping up this video. We need an enclosure. This can be almost anything, but something that stands taller than egg crates is a must. The second is egg crates. How many you need depends on the size of the container, but for the 27 gallon I use, one pack of 20 crates is enough to do one whole bin. We need a thermostat and a heating pad combo to ensure that we're keeping it warm enough in the enclosure. We also need a humidity gauge, which can be comboed with a temp gauge, but I suggest one inside and one outside of the enclosure. We need a pressure sprayer to mist the colony. A spray bottle can work, you'll just kill your hand. Something optional but highly recommended creating with within your first year of breeding is the bucket sorter. So we need 5 buckets, a drill bit set from half inch to one quarter inch, and a drill. Your total for absolutely everything is around 120 to 130 US dollars, not counting where you get your roaches. And that should be everything that you need to get going and go for over a year easy maybe two, but make sure you have everything but the sorter before you start, otherwise you may have a bad experience. If you follow this guide, you will have success. That about does it guys. I tried to be a bit more concise with this guide and more complete compared to previous iterations of this video series. I actually set out to make the first videos as a series instead of breeding guides, which honestly makes no sense to me now, but I have compiled everything from my previous videos into one video that, going forward, should require very little updating as I now I've been doing this for years and have researched these animals to death and have some experience under my belt. I have read almost everything I can google about these animals and what I've learned myself over the years. If you like this video and have it in your critter loving heart, give this video a like, a subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more videos in the future like this. And as always, from the critters and I, have a wonderful day.